Hello everybody, this is Jason Sisko and we are live on a lovely Friday and we welcome you to another edition of our High Noon broadcast. Prayer Nation, it is such a delight to have you with us. This is a collaboration between the Church Triumphant and Triumph Ministries International Network. The Church Triumphant is here in the greater Houston area. We welcome you at any time. We would love to have you. And our global arm is Triumph Ministries International Network. We are so thankful for our global partners. We have international friends, intercessors, missionaries, great leaders, men and women of God from many nations around the world that join with us. We're so thankful that we have representatives from almost every continent uh, that from time to time, if they don't do it every week, from time to time have connected with us. And of course, we want this to grow because God does nothing except in response to a prayer. Most important thing we can do is to operate and function with a life of prayer. God has connected to us as his earth partners. He has made his will join with us. And so we pray thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. To all of our local partners, friends, to all the churches of the area, to our uh, Bishop Foss and to uh, uh, Bishop Glass, of course, from Church Triumphant, to all of our pastors in the area, we love you, we are praying with you and for you. To our Church Triumphant family, today we focus just a little bit more on the local front and we pray collectively for that. But of course, uh, this is global and so we have a global initiative. This is something that helps us as we pray locally on a larger scale to be tied into the things that matter most. And as we do, it helps whatever local problems that we have to be diminished and lessened when we think about the big picture. But also as we pray globally and connect with those local congregations around the United States and around the world, uh, something else happens. We also find that we are a part of a global community called the church. When I traveled, I would often feel what I would call the jet stream of the global church, is that there is an acceleration and a movement within the body of Christ that is, that is global. And then I would try to bring that in to the local churches because oftentimes we can have the nuance of just our daily lives and just what we know from our own experience. And that creates a, a faith perimeter around us that says God can only do this much because this is all I have observed. But when we have other testimonies and then we read the books uh, of the Bible that declare these different churches and what was going on in them, and then we read the historical accounts and we look through the book of Acts, we say, I'm aligned with something so much bigger than the congregation that I'm a part of here. And so the global and local coming together is a glorious and beautiful thing, and we're so thankful for it. God has given us three initiatives, and we talk about them every time just to be a reminder of what God is doing and what he will do. Visitation. Visitation is unprecedented works and moves of the Holy Spirit. We see a type and shadow of only five visitations in the entire Bible. So this is not something we say, well, well, we had a visitation last night. You may have had God's spirit come and it was fresh and there was a manifestation of his presence and glory. But a visitation is when he totally resets what is possible in the mind and the eyes of the entire world. Before the first visitation, they had to work through a priest. They had to work through a law and a system of sacrifices and burnt offerings. But when Jesus came, there was something amazing that happened. The Messiah that was long waited for finally came and it was God manifest in flesh and the world has never been the same. Time was split in two. And of course, when he was uh, crucified on the cross, even uh, the sun itself refused to shine. So this is what a visitation does. It is earth altering. It is time changing. It is forever uh, increasing our capacity to come into his presence and to know him. From there, we see the third hour visitation, which is uh, the day of Pentecost. It's one thing to know that God walked among us. It's something else for him to be within us. Wow, what a glorious experience to know that that same Holy Ghost and the angels themselves say, I wish I could get in on that. I'd like to know more about that. Eternal beings that can come in and out of time and space that know what the presence of God is like want to trade places with us to receive the Holy Spirit. This is the scope of a visitation. And then we go to uh, the ninth hour and the... Th 
uh, the sixth hour and the ninth hour, which were Samaria and Cornelius's house. Each one of these is now increasing our capacity to reach more people. The laying on of hands for the Holy Ghost is, a, is an acceleration to think that that was something that continued on. No more tarrying for the Holy Ghost. Now the men of God lay their hands upon you. When you get to Cornelius, it's through the spoken word. Now it's no longer even laying hands on. But as many people as can hear the voice of God can immediately receive from God through the power of the spoken word. This is God setting us up for multitudes receiving the Holy Spirit. I witnessed at 600,000 people in Ethiopia when Billy Cole spoke the, spoke the word of God. And in one command, 78,000 people received the gift of the Holy Spirit speaking with other tongues. And this did not just happen once. This happened repeatedly over and over and over again. 30,000, 50,000, 72,000. We had over 100,000 one year that received the Holy Ghost. Uh, and Doug Kleindance was a part of that. So it is, it is just absolutely amazing to know that there is no limit to God. So this last visitation will eclipse all of them. The last visitation of God will be the greatest and best. And this is what we are praying for that God will build upon all of these visitations and that we will have one final visitation in the 11th hour for the purpose of reaching the most souls, a billion soul harvest. This is the bare minimum of what we ask of God, a, a, a billion soul harvest, a Jesus name, apostolic wave of glory sweeping through the earth, glory clouds covering whole cities, whole communities of people, and you and I being right in the middle of that, laying hands on, praying for the sick. The saints will arise up and will be mightily and greatly used of God. The last movement will be a saints movement. Why stand you around idle? No more idle saints. There will be an activating of these signs shall follow them that believe. This is what we are praying for. This is what is our constant vision. This is what we hold within our hearts. So this is visitation. Secondly is transformation. Jesus led them up before he showed them uh, what it looks like to face the Antichrist spirit. He led them up and gave them a vision of him. And so before we face this Antichrist system effectively, before we can speak life in a place of people dying before we can overcome all of the frustration, the chaos, the offenses, all of the twisting of, 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 of words, all of the uh, ineptitude of tradition. We must first see Jesus in a high place. This comes through fasting and prayer, fasting and prayer. This kind goes not but by prayer and fasting, but I emphasize fasting first because they were already praying. It takes another level of consecration to win in these hours. So we have just come out of these uh, days of fasting. Many of us uh, fasted more than the days of awe. And I thank you for all that fasted with us, the full 21. For those of you that fasted 10 days from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur last night, thank you so much. For those of you that fasted at all, if you did one day, three days, if you did a partial fast, if you just gave up something like coffee or sugar, thank you so much for having the spirit of fasting during this time. As we go into this civic new year of the Jewish calendar, it is important for us to prepare ourselves to have a time of prayer and fasting and consecration. And now we rejoice. But transformation happens through prayer and fasting, through climbing that mountain, through seeing Jesus, through rising above everything else in the world and just being in his presence. Yesterday, I was, I was reminded as I wept before the Lord that what was most significant about Yom Kippur was the fact that that was the one day when they were allowed to be in the, in the awesome presence of God, where his glory cloud would dwell and sit in the mercy seat, where God himself would literally come and judge. And when they would come in, he said that you die not. This is what I require of you, that you die not. It was so awesome that if, you were, if, that if you were in one way not right with him, it would be enough to kill you. I want to be in the awesome presence of God to the degree that it's not just I feel his presence here or, oh, isn't it nice? The spirit of God is moving. I want it to be the, the all-consuming presence of God. And I began to weep and I began to say, this is what you purchased for us at the cross 
that we could come boldly before the throne of grace? Is anyone thankful today that we can come boldly before the throne of grace? Would you just lift your hands to him right now? And would you thank him together with me? Father, we just thank you today that we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in the time of need. I thank you, Lord, that we have access to your very throne room in Jesus' name. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise. The final initiative is multiplication, multiplication. So we want the church to go into a season where we are so mature that God can multiply us. So I think that part of what's happening during COVID and the aftermath of this um, pandemic, which in some places now uh, downgraded to an epidemic, um, there are some regions where it is not as strong, some states where it's not as strong, and we are thankful for that. Other places it is raging again, and there's lots of reason, reasons for that, which we will not get into. Just the fact that it is happening. I, I'm praying with our brothers in Asia, and I was connecting with um, my, my other brother uh, from another mother, Brother Timothy Lee, Pastor Timothy Lee in Singapore, and they're having a big outbreak there in Singapore again of the D variant, as they are in many other countries. But we were praying uh, yesterday and interceding yesterday about that. But we are, we are aware that, that the need is for multiplication, that we don't just need a few people that are praying effectively. We need a lot of people. And it's not just the fact that people are praying. It's that people know how to pray. So my role, part of what I am sent to the global church to do, is to help to train and to teach what God has taught me. There are still many more things to learn. But God told me to teach what I had learned about prayer and that people would come alongside of me and they would pray with me. And together he would cause the gifts of the spirit to operate around the world and that there would be mighty demonstration of the spirit of God. So let's put our armor on. Let's come together in alignment and let's pray. And I have some things that I want to tell you that would seem sobering at first, but I want to be honest with you. It is part of my job as a watchman Part of my role in the global church is to lead in global prayer, to operate with authority, apostolic authority. Uh, and I say that very intentionally and not in a general way, but in a very specific way. That is my office, uh, my spiritual calling and what I'm sent to do. But a part of that goes with being um, a watchman on the wall. And so I want to tell you some of the things that I see so that you can be ready. And I have asked the Lord of this, and I do have some insights about what is coming and what we can do about it. So this is my biggest and greatest desire is that we will be prepared. So I'm going to pray uh, with you uh, right now, and I'm going to ask you to get in whatever position that you can get in to be in alignment with God. And hopefully, if you've been praying and fasting with me, you will already feel quite in tune. So let's go in now and let's align ourselves. Father, we come to you today and we are reminded of all the resources of your kingdom. But Lord, we know that the kingdom means nothing if I cannot be with the king. We come before you and we say that you are not just our sovereign who is high above all things, far above all principalities and powers and mights and, and dominions and every name that is named not only in this world but that which is to come. You have again celebrated your coronation as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. We have blown the trumpets and declared that you are the King of the universe and that you are the Lord of glory and you are the, the King of all the earth and most importantly, the King of our own hearts. But Lord, even more than that, we call you Father. We, we call you Father. I can come and sit with you. I can come and be with you because you've made us a part of the royal household of faith through forgiveness of sins, by the blood of the lamb, by the ransom that was paid, by the sealing of ourselves in the Holy Spirit and by baptism in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you today that we can come boldly before you. Thank you for washing us, for cleansing us, for forgiving us. You know that we are but dust. You know that we are but flesh. You know every gap. You know every weakness. You know every inconsistency. You know what we're going to pray before we pray it, and yet you are so gracious to us. Thank you, Father, that you allow us to approach. You allow us to speak. You allow us to even say something. For as Abraham said, though I be ashes and dust, but yet let me speak one more thing. And Moses came before you, and he spoke 
boldly as a man would speak to his face to face to a, to his friend. And so, Lord, I thank you that we can speak face to face to you, that we can talk to you, that we can approach you. We do not take it lightly that we have access to your presence. And we pray, Lord, that you would sanctify us this day again. Wash us, cleanse us, purify us. Let every thought and every heart, let it not just be right in your presence, but let us go out of your presence changed. Let it not just be long enough for us to pray a prayer to get something that we desire, but let it be something that we would carry your desires with us, that in your presence, our desires change. For he that delights himself in the Lord, will, he will give him the desires of his heart. Give us the desires of your heart today. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you. I love you, Jesus. I worship you. Can you tell him that you love him today? Can you just close your eyes right now and tell him something lovely about himself, something amazing about him? Tell him something personal about him that you love. Jesus, I love your ways. I love your ways. I love your boldness. I love your authority. And yet I love your gentleness and your tenderness. I love that you always know what to do, that you always know what to say. You know when to be silent and when to speak. You're always in control. You never change. You're always perfect. Thank you, Father, that you've been there for me in so many times when I've needed you, that you've taken a personal interest in me, and I thank you, God, for that. Thank you for the times when you've spoken to me so intimately and you've cared about me. Thank you, Lord, for the correction. Thank you for the reproof. Have you ever been reproved of the Lord? Thank him for that. Because he loves you, that means you're a true son. You're a true daughter. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you. My dad used to sing this song years ago. Come in to my heart. Come in to my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Do you love him today? Would you lift your hands to him one more time right where you are? Would you thank him for all those recovering from COVID? Thank you. For all those that have been sick, thank you. For those that are still struggling with sickness, thank you for being there for me, for being there with me, for everything that God has already brought you through, for everything that he's brought me through, thank you. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, we ask you to renew our minds and to renew our hearts in Jesus' name. Make our feet like hinds feet and set us upon your high places. We consecrate ourselves, spirit and soul and body to you, that we would see with your eyes, hear with your ears, smell with your nose, taste with your tongue, feel the way you feel. Oh God, that we would love who you love and we would love what you love and we would love the way that you love. That we would think your thoughts, that we would have your words and that we would do your actions. We would please you in all things, Father. We pray that we would have the mind of Christ, that we would reject the carnal mind, that we would know what it is and know how to be released from its influence. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded is, means from your word that it's possible to be spiritually minded. So if it is possible, then make it so. Let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds to prove what is that good, that acceptable, and that perfect will of God. We ask in Jesus' name that according to the pattern that you've had for us from the foundation of the world, that it shall be done for us individually. It will be done for us as local churches. It will be done for us, O oh God, as your global church. It will be done in this generation, O oh God, for the people. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name that you would help us to reach as many as you have purchased, oh God, as many as you are calling, help us to reach them, that your number, oh God, of what you have desired, oh God, and the ones that we reach will be the same, that we will not do less than, oh God, we will not fall short, 
But we thank you, Father, that you are giving us the plans and patterns that we can be exceedingly abundant, abundantly in our fruit. In Jesus' name, we pray that our hearts would be one with your heart and that our will with your will, our mind, our will, our emotions, our very souls would be restored. And that with our spirit man, we would be joined unto the Lord. For he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And all of the resources of the Messiah now flow through from the headship of Christ now down through us. They flow down through us. You are the head and we are the body and the enemy is under our feet. So Lord, we thank you for what comes from your right hand and what comes from your left. We thank you for the seven spirits of God, for the nine gifts of the spirit, for the other uh, ministry gifts that you've given to us, for the fivefold ministry. We thank you, Father, for all the ways that you empower us by grace. We thank you for fruit and the fruit of the spirit. We thank you, Father, for all things that you have given to us with warfare, the name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of the Lamb, the Holy Spirit, and angels. We thank you, Lord, for praise. We thank you, Lord, for prayer, for all the forms of prayer that you have given to us. We thank you in Jesus' name now for the armor. Let's put it on together. The loins good about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Lift your hands in worship right now. The word is already coming. The prophetic word is already coming. Think not that you put the armor on today in vain, for it is not just for this moment or for this time of prayer, but I have girded you to war as my great army. I am raising you up, says the Lord, and I'm sending you forth. From this moment, you shall enter into the warfare and you shall prevail, says the Lord. Though you bear long and though you uh, have much time uh, of prayer and, in, and there will be agony and there will be weeping and there will be intercession and yet you shall never doubt me and you shall never fear and you shall never be anxious, but you shall be relentless for I, the Lord, will put that spirit of, of intercession upon you. I shall show you the victory, even before I give it to you, that you will continue to be relentless in your prayers until the battle turns. It shall turn, says the Lord, for I have raised you up and I have ordained you. But there shall be a time of wrestling. There shall be a time of moaning. There shall be a time of weeping. For even as my word says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So think not that I have failed you because there is a time of waiting. Think not that I have failed you because... The, the battle wax hot against you. But know that I shall give you the advance warning and I shall show you the future and I shall encourage your hearts and you shall be as fierce as lions, says the Lord. And you shall go forth mightily and you shall conquer. For there be much, much at stake, says the Lord. Many souls are in the balance and there be many forces that vie for them. There shall be many spirits that shall join themselves together. Man with man and man with demonic force, says the Lord your God. But do I not know these confederacies? Do I not know these unholy alliances? Have I not seen their blood sacrifices? Do I not know their conjurings? Have I not heard their mutterings and their peeping? Have I not seen their false prophets? Do I not know their witches? Have I not declared about the sorcery that would be in the last days? That even that wicked and evil city would be the habitation of every hateful and unclean bird. And how that they, through the voice of this false prophet and through the beast, shall deceive the whole world. But behold, my people shall not be deceived. You shall not be turned out of the way. You shall not be pushed back, says the Lord, but you shall fight. You shall go in my name and you shall conquer, though you have to bear long and though your patience be tested, says the Lord. Yet, you shall prevail. Did I not say he that endures to the end shall be saved? So endure hardness as a good soldier, says the Lord, and I will give you the victory. Mm. Asamakiyatama. 
Ila la mo katia malasi hikaya. Ila lo mo kosa koma takaya la matai. Isa vo roko ya mata sila la mako ya masa. Do you receive it today? Do you receive the word of the Lord today? Do you accept this as from the Lord? Does it bear witness in you as a word from the Lord? If so, I want you just to, again, lift your hands to him right now. And I want you to say, thank you, Jesus, for your word. And if you could let me know, uh, push that heart button or just type in amen. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, some of you cannot comment because you're uh, just projecting it on the big screen. But do something right now. Act upon this word in some way by saying amen because it is through that action that it seals it in your hearts. Faith is always sealed by a response. So we thank the Lord today for his word in Jesus' name. Now, there are three reasons, and I am not even to the script yet, but this is what the Lord, you know, he is doing live and why we do a live broadcast. We want to follow what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us. So number one, why is there a delay? Sometimes God is working something out in our character. So if he did something instantly, we would not have had the time being in his presence. We would have been fixed too quickly. We would re resort back to our old ways. So I'll give you an example. When a sheep is... When a sheep is wayward and it constantly wanders away, what does it do? Uh, the, 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 the shepherd will find that sheep and he will, he will break its bones. He's wandered away so many times it will break a bone. This is what Psalms 51 is talking about. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Let me be joyful. Let me be happy. Why? Because... David realized he had been wayward. He'd wandered away from God. It's a chapter of repentance. He had gravely, gravely failed in murder and in adultery. And yet God let him live. And he says, so God has broken my bones. Why? He knew as a shepherd what he would do to a sheep that constantly went away. He would break it. And so then he was carefully wrap the leg again, reset the leg so that it could be used again. It could be walked upon again. But it doesn't heal in a day. It takes maybe weeks before it's perfect. So then he takes that sheep and he puts it over his shoulders. And that sheep will eat from his hand. And he will nurse that sheep. But he will get the scent of the shepherd. He'll get the, 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 the respiratory rhythm of his breath. And that sheep will bond so tightly to the shepherd. That they say that sheep will then, after his leg is healed... He'll be nipping at his robe. He'll be right there at his feet. He will never wander off. He'll be the closest of all the sheep because he has been so up close and personal. He went through pain and then he was healed from that pain. He realized I could have died. I have no protection. And now the shepherd has brought me close. So sometimes there are problems and trials in our lives where, where, where God is going to break us or it's a delay because he is wanting to deal with something for the long term. So there's a prolonged battle. For example, Goliath went down fast, bam. But Saul, it was a decade. David had to be mentored by Saul what not to be, because he was about to be king. If he would have gone straight from killing Goliath to being a king, he could have made as many mistakes or more mistakes than Saul made. But he had a mentor in Saul, that God said, I want you to see what not to do. Let me show you. I'm going to have him come after you. I'm going to let you feel the insecurity. I'm going to let you see this over a period of years. I'm going to let you watch through all these different cycles of life until something is so deeply resolved in you that you're not going to be like that, then I can trust you to reign. So there are certain times when God does this. There are certain times when there is a delay, and that's what it's about. He's working something out. Other times, it is because of the immensity of, of, the, uh, of people that are involved. 
When you are dealing with high levels like principalities and powers, you are talking about whole networks that have sworn their loyalty. So there are wicked people. The Bible talks about spiritual wickedness in high places. Wickedness is different from transgression or transgressors, sin and sinors. Wicked and wickedness is different. In the, in the Greek, it doesn't mean that you just do sin willfully. It means that you are actively trying to recruit people to do it with you. That you actively despise. You actively work against all that is righteous. So it's one thing to say, I'm not going to live for God. I'm going to do what I want. That's just being, that's just being a transgressor. I, no one's going to tell me what to do. But you are not actively out there recruiting people to go do something heinous. They know what they are. They know exactly what they're doing. And they've decided to keep doing it in spite of. They're trying to get around it. This is Satan. Satan knows he's wrong. He knows he's damned to hell. But he's trying to get around his judgment. So he's looking for any loophole and any way around. So he is recruiting people. And he's offering them the power that he has. They take that power. And then they begin to actively work in the same spirit. So when you are binding yourself to Satan, that's a human will. So it's more than just casting out a, a demon spirit. It is now protected by the will of men. And those will of, the will of men now reserve that. They are able to, um, they are able to uh, use their, their rights in the presence of God to uh, uh, what we would say a fair trial. It would be much the way uh, mafia people or the, much the way uh, people that are, 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 are serial killers, they constantly use the process against us. They constantly use the law against us. They get off on technicalities because they know it. This is what Satan is trying to do. He's a prosecuting accuser, prosecuting accuser in the presence of God. So we stand together in Jesus' name and we continue to pray. So the, the greatest way we, we can dismantle a principality over a region is by winning souls because it's less wills that are, that are giving uh, weight there. So we are wrestling over the will of man because God is not going to cause the spirit of a man to go out because they'll die. They'll be lost forever. So we have to war against the, the amount of wills and the mentalities that hold those minds. And so we know, we know that the God of this world has blinded their eyes. So we are praying and penetrating through that darkness, preaching the truth and the truth that makes people free. And the more truth is broadcast, the more people hear it, the more people uh, are, are listening to it, the more truth is out there, the more mindsets begin to soften and change. So that's what the wrestling is. That's what the battle is, is over these mindsets. It's not whether we have the authority or not. It's all of the men and their wills that have aligned themselves with those principalities and powers. So this is why the battle uh, wages long time. Uh, the, the, the third possible reason why there might be a delay is because of simple timing is that there is a timing involved uh, that God sees something that we do not see. And he is working out details for all these things to happen exactly when he wants them to happen. And what I have seen oftentimes is that God has a perfect strategy from the foundation of the world. And uh, if he did, if he did, if he moved too soon, uh, you can say like this in a, um, in a football line to use a, 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 a a football analogy, that if somebody jumps ahead, uh, it's a foul. It's a, called a uh, false start. Or it can be offsides. So, and then it messes up the alignment and the rhythm of the whole team. And so if, if, if too far, if we're, if we're not in sync, so God wants all these things to happen in sync so that the enemy doesn't know what's coming. He's not going to prophesy it until it's already too late for the enemy. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He knew what Calvary was all about. But the devil didn't know about Calvary. So understand that, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so there are some things that he does not make known in the beginning to us. Because if he did, it would tip the hand of the enemy and the enemy could make an adjustment. So this is where we are uh, in the spirit. This is what God is doing in the Holy Ghost. So I want to just talk to you for a little bit about what the Lord is saying uh, to me, uh, coming into this broadcast today to give us some directives about having a fresh resolve and determination to go through. And with that, I want you to lift your hands again to the Lord. I want you to give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. 
for your presence, God, right now. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing right now. Thank you, God, for your promises, which are yea and amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise in Jesus' name. All right, here's what the Lord is saying to us from his word today that you can take away, that you can go and pray and read. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Now, I want you to see the verse 2. I want you to see this. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I am the Lord thy God. Now I want you to watch this one more time. It's not an if. It is a when. When thou passest through. So I want you to notice that we will have water to deal with. We will have rivers that will overflow the banks. We will have fire that could destroy us. We will have flame that is kindled. We'll have these things. It is not an if. Now, in our American uh, or Western mindset here, for those of you that join with us from other parts of the world, I know that you have much more patience. When I am in, um, for example, uh, when I go to China or Asia, they uh, the patience that they have is immense. When I uh, And the hunger is just the capacity to learn and to grow is huge. Uh, when you go to India, you know, their whole life is long lines. We went to Mexico City. They told us, even in Mexico, uh, you can have three hours of traffic every day. It's just a part of their life. When I went to cent uh, 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 Central America, uh, I mean, it didn't matter that there were earthquakes when we were in Guatemala, uh, the power's coming in and coming out. It doesn't matter. We're going to have church anyway. I mean, can you imagine uh, in America? Well, folks, the power could be on or could be off. I mean, everyone would be saying, I'm, I'm not going. If it's on, we'll watch online. And we just, we're just a bunch of wusses and we don't have any time. We don't have any time for this. Uh, when I was in Brazil, they go uh, seven in the morning till midnight. Uh, it just, uh, just so hungry. So parts around the world, they have a lot more patience, a lot more hunger. Uh, the Russian people, for example, they, they talk about how much patience that they have. They're used to it, long winters, etc. But much of the Western civilization, everything is there, quote unquote, for our convenience. I mean, we want to know everything right now. We don't want to wait for anything. We want to have a microwave, you know, um, uh, zap, whatever it is. I mean, uh, you know, we got air fryers, so we don't have to uh, you know, we have pressure cookers. I mean, come on, pressure cookers are to take those ribs and make them soft in, in two hours because we don't want to wait overnight. We don't have to get up and spray it, you know, and put the lemon, uh, the, uh, the apple juice on there and, and, you know, oh, we have to rub it again. Oh my goodness, I have to get up at two o'clock. I'm not having ribs. I'll just go down to the barbecue and buy it. We are all about our convenience. And oftentimes we bring that into the presence of the Lord and God, why haven't you heard my prayer? And he goes, well, that was from yesterday. You know, like, there are some prayers that are memorial prayers. And there are some times that we are just, uh, I think, bound and determined that it's, nothing's going to happen to us. And if something happens to us, then, oh my goodness, God has failed us. Do you realize after 9-11, 2001, that faith in America did not increase? It dramatically decreased, especially amongst what we would now call millennials. Those in the age of 20 to 30, after 9-11, many of them became much more skeptical. They became more agnostic, atheistic. They began to walk away from church, walk away from their, uh, their faith. And you ask the question, why? Why? Because they said, how would a loving God allow something like that to happen? So their conclusion is, God should keep us from all harm. Nothing should ever happen to our country. Nothing should ever happen to any of us. And then we'll serve God as long as uh, he protects us on every side. That's his part of the deal. Now, we can do whatever we want. And he just has to forgive us. I mean, we can live uh, 
you know, with ever, whatever fleshly desires we have, we can go to whatever movies we want. We can drink if we want to. I mean, we can, who's going to tell me what to do? I'm an American. You're not going to tell, I mean, we can kill babies by the millions. I mean, we, we can, we can have abortion. I mean, we can have all kinds of, I mean, prostitution. We can have all kinds of human trafficking going on. I mean, the fact that there is a market for human trafficking. Okay, talk about, let's stop it. No, 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 no. There wouldn't be human trafficking if there weren't consumers. There are people buying these kids. There are people holding them, molesting them, destroying them, and then discarding them and by the millions. And you think that God does not see this? That God does not know this? And then when we have one... Uh, one 9-11 happened, suddenly Americans have lost their faith. That shows you where our mindset is. We think that God is somehow our big Santa Claus in the sky, and nothing should ever happen to us because, you know, we're Christian, we're a Christian nation. And it just shows how spoiled we are and how out of touch we truly are. And so God is trying to get our attention. God is trying to wake up the world. And there's a lot of things that went along with that. There's a lot of human will. Say, why is there sickness in the world? Because there's sin. Why is there why are there wars and rumors of wars? Because there's a stubborn will of man. Is this the desire of God? Uh, when you read about the millennial reign, uh, you'll study war no more. In the millennial reign, when Jesus rules with a rod of iron over the nations of the world, you know what's gonna happen? The leaves on the trees will produce fruit for the healing of the nations, and they produce every month. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The, the, the child will put his hand at the hole uh, at the hole of the asp. I mean, th there, there will be, there, people will live a millennial. Everything will be reset and back to normal. When man's in charge, man's kingdoms, this is where you get all of these wars and rumors of wars. This is where you get all of this corruption. This is where you get all this sin. So people lose their faith in God the moment that something doesn't go the way we think God should be running the universe. We're offended and we're angry. So this is not an if. We have to realize as the church that we will have trouble. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. When? When you're in the water. And the water could, it seem, overthrow you. What is he saying to you? I'm going to be with you. So the whole idea here is not that God is going to keep you from something that could destroy you from happening to you. But that thing that would seem to have power over you will not have power over you because you are an overcomer because he is with you. So this is the part that I want us all to see. There is trouble coming. There is more trouble coming. This is the, the part that we don't like. This is the heaviness that we don't like. We spent some considerable amount of time in the summer just talking about the goodness of God, just talking about the mercies of God, talking about the kingdom of God. God told me to look up. This is the importance. We had to look up into the kingdom resources. We have to operate and function, all of us, with this uh, setting our affection on things above and not on things in the earth. God, is, God was calibrating us for all of us that were being prepared to be mightily used. But here's the thing. When we go through this, God's going to be with us. And so it can't be about me when we're in the river, okay? It cannot be about you anymore. We are to lose our life in Christ so that when the rivers are overflowing, we are so confident that God is with us that we will not be overthrown by that. It will not overflow us, that I will never be concerned, no matter how high the river is or, or how much rain is pounding down uh, from the mountainside and flooding the valleys, I will never, I am only there saying, I'm grabbing this one, I'm grabbing this one, I'm grabbing this one. Here's somebody else sliding over here. It's going to be how we can help because we know that God is with us. It's never about, oh God, what are we going to do? Oh, the river's rising. I can't believe you allowed the river to rise. <laughs> can you believe that? Why would God be so angry with it? I'm like, stop all the whining people. We have to all stop it. We have to all stop it. He promised us that this was coming. God is more interested in our spiritual maturity than he is in our comfort. We have so much more growth when we're pushed. You say, I want the last wine. Well, then you have to be a wineskin that can stretch. 
Oh, I want God to clothe me with that, with those garments. I want to be, I want to wear the garment of a king. Well, that means that, that uh, you can't sew a new cloth onto an old garment. You got to get rid of your old thinking, your old mentality, your old identity. You got to cast that off. Take off the spirit of heaviness and put on a garment of praise. Get clothed in this. The apostles rejoiced when they were beaten. They celebrated that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. So the true apostolic church will arise. The rivers are coming. They're, they will be overflowing their banks and many people will be in harm's way. But God's going to be with us. The fire. Oh God, keep us from the fire. Oh God, stop the fire. And I was praying about this. I was praying about all these things. I was asking him yesterday during our time of, of fasting and prayer and just really focusing in, asking for revelation knowledge about this year and asking him to speak to me for the body of Christ and to give direction. And there were many things that God hid deep in my spirit. But one of the things that the Lord talked to me about was changing my prayers. And this will be, uh, this will be different from other things that I have said in times past. Um, it is not taking away something, it is adding to um, a, comp a compilation of revelation. But let's continue with this verse here and then we'll get to it, okay? And I wanna tell you one more thing. I wanna close this out with revelation. So those of you that have stayed with me this whole time, uh, hopefully it's worthwhile to stay to the end. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Now I love this. The fire is gonna be there, but you're gonna walk through. Everyone say walk through. Watch this, pass through, through the rivers, through the waters. You're going you're gonna to walk through the fire and you're not going to be burned. So God, instead of taking the fire away or quenching the fire, he said, I'm going to make you waterproof. I'm going to make you fireproof. It shall not kindle upon thee. It will not, there's nothing in you. There's no kindling. There's nothing that can catch on fire. Uh, and I was noticing today, I, I like to have, my fast is over, I, I, I like to have a corn tortilla with eggs. That's one of my favorite little breakfast things. But I, I take the corn tortilla and I put it right on the, the fire on the stove. I don't put it in a pan. I want to put it right on top and I just turn the gas fire on and it, it's direct fire. And I, I was noticing today, my tortilla caught on fire. I was like, I didn't know that corn tortillas could burn. I know flour could, because we've had that happen before, but I didn't know corn tortillas could burn. Usually they just kind of, uh, just get browned, but it actually caught on fire. And I was like, wow, uh, you can catch, you can catch it on fire. Like you could use this. Um, you could use this, I guess, if you got really desperate, uh, for, for some kind of, uh, you know, fireplace. We, we need some, something else. Else, Just throw a tortilla on, <laughs> throw a, so throw a log, throw a tortilla on the fire. But, uh, you know, there's something in us. Can we burn? He said, he said, your flesh could burn. It could burn. It could catch on fire. He said, but it won't. So that means we are so dedicated. We are so given over to the things of God that things that would burn won't. Things that could be touched would not be touched. We know this with the three Hebrew children, and we love to talk about it when we were uh, in, in uh, school in Sunday school, we love to talk about it, how they were thrown into the fire and the only thing that burned off of them was the ropes. Only thing that burned off was the restraints. And the angel of the Lord was with them in the fire and they walked around in the midst of the fire and then they just walked out of the fire. And that not even the smell of smoke was upon them. If God did it for three, can't God do it, to use King James, for thee, if we're gonna re remind it. If God did it for them, won't he do it for us? Of course he will. So this is what the Lord is saying. You're going to pass through. So I want you to have a resolve. I want you to put this in your spirit today. This is what God has given me for, some, for a long term. I want you to just build for the long term. But I want you to rejoice. I don't want you to groan with it. I don't want you to resent it. I just want you to say, well, the Lord told us this was coming. So let's see how we can be used. Let's see how God is using this to get the world's attention. Because how, the, how God deals with the world is different from how God deals with the church. God deals with the church with a trumpet. God deals with the church with trumpets. He awakens you at midnight. The cry, the cry, the midnight cry. Hey, wake up. Do, 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 do. Wake up. The bridegroom is coming. The only people that hear that is people looking for a bride and a bridegroom to get together. The only people that, the only people that are a part of that uh, are those representing the bride. 
the bridal party. That's, that's it. The world doesn't hear it. The world doesn't know it. They're not listening for it. It's midnight. They're asleep. So there's things that God is going to speak to the church that the world will not hear. Okay? So how God deals with the church is different. How God deals with the world is the trembling of the earth because of sin. The earth groans and travails together until now. So all this stuff about climate change, a lot of it is politically motivated. A lot of it is financially uh, 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 motivated. You know, they, they want carbon credits and they want taxes and they want to you know, take control of businesses and things like that as if those things are really going to affect climate change and oh, maybe the tiniest little bit. But um, I mean, they talk about the effect of cows on the earth and the amount of people that are on the planet because there's 8 billion people on this planet whose temperature is 98.6. You would expect that we've never had 8 billion people on this planet before. So, of course, the temperature would rise just by virtue of putting people in the same room with 98.6. It's harder to keep it cool. Think about that. You have two people in the room or 100 people in the room. It's going to be harder to keep it cool. Uh, these things are, are, are so far beyond our control. But, but all of the irregularities in the earth, the Bible says that, uh, famines and pestilences, and all, this is the result of sin. If you really want to fix it and heal the land, we need to repent. We need to repent. But the earth is being shook. God is getting the attention of people right now. He's getting the attention of people right now. This is supposed to get their, get their minds off of their little world and get them out to think about God. COVID is supposed to help people to realize their own mortality so that they'll seek after God and find Him. So God is dealing with the world differently, and we have to make a difference in the world. Now, I have been telling you for a long time about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He who now restrains will, he rest will restrain until he be taken out of the way. That remains true and unchanging. That remains true. I will stand by that. But I was asking the Lord about this. I was saying, God, it appears that some things are just a part of the prophetic time clock. I was asking him this yesterday. That some things are going to happen that we cannot stop. I mean, like we as the church thought that COVID was a bad thing. We saw the agenda behind it. We prayed even more against the agenda. And again, we don't know all the effects. We don't know all the things. We saw, I, I saw a vision of the Lord pulling back one of the horses of the apocalypse. And so I know that there were many things that were coming upon the earth that were slowed by our prayers, without doubt. The freedoms that we all have right now, the rejoicing that we all have right now. It's like what the Lord said to me in June. What are you going to do with the quiet? Because last June, there was nothing uh, but chaos. Cities burning, race riots, outbreaks, COVID, people dying. Uh, I mean, just uh, anarchy, the feeling of just overthrow, defund the police, uh, just all of this stuff about, uh, about people just, just being pent up and, and the mob rule. And just, it was a feeling of, of we could go into a civil war. And then here in June, a year later, Everything is calm. Everyone seems to be at peace. No doubt the prayers of the saints had something to do with that. No doubt the church and its tremendous amount of, um, of prayer and fasting had something to do with that. No doubt. But I was asking the Lord about these things. And as I was praying about it, I, I was like, it seemed that there are some things that could not be moved. It seemed that some things could not change. And I've talked to you about this before, but God added one more thing to it. So I'm bringing together the unmovable part of God's will and the movable part that is in the world. So there are things that are prophetic and then there are things that relate to prayer. So either, either it, is, it is a prophecy that will be that is absolute or it's a conditional prophecy that if you will, I will. So these are, these are the things that we have to discern. We have to discern whether this is God's absolute authority or whether this is his delegated authority. So there are some things within the realm of God's absolute authority that we have no say. Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour, not the son, but the father only. So in other words, it's not, it does not pertain into the earthly ministry of Christ. That which is, belongs into the domain of, of time and space, that's what the, the son of God was manifest in time and space. That's God manifest in time and in space. Jesus speaking as a man, as the God man said, the flesh doesn't know. The human part of this doesn't know. I'm operating on the same principle. In other words, Jesus was saying, I operate on the same principle that you have to operate on. Jesus didn't whip the devil as God. He whipped him as the son of God. 
He did it in the flesh as a man through the help of the Holy Spirit so that when we receive the Holy Spirit and when we were born again, we could use the same principles of saying he was tempted in all points. God cannot be tempted. So the son was tempted, not the father. The father is the full totality of God, the full deity of God, the awesome qualities of God. He who inhabits eternity, that one whose, whose light is so bright that we cannot approach unto it. He dwells in a light which no man approaches. No man can see God and live. And yet we see Jesus, which is God manifest in flesh. So what Jesus is saying is, for us, there's some things that no man knows the day nor the hour. But the Father knows. In other words, this is a part of his authority. There are some things that God has ordained that are a part of his authority that nobody gets to tinker with. Known unto God are his works from the foundation of the world. So he just reveals them to us. So he showed Joseph, there's going to be a famine. Don't pray about it. But what you can do, because I'm giving you an advance notice, is you can be prepared. So there are some things that are coming in these last days that, that relate exactly to the types and shadows that God put in. God put a seven-year tribulation in the books. It's so, it's so much going to happen and unalterable that we have a whole book of the Bible that explains every detail of it. So God has already said, these things are going to happen. Now, what is our part? We're in the church age. In the church age, we are to pray and fast. What does he say? Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers. So, so we're over here trying to change uh, the events of the prophetic time clock. And God is wanting us to have a harvest. So we're focusing on the wrong thing. So as I begin to pray about this, God brought me back to the book of Esther. And so I know we're, we're already at an hour right now. I won't go very deep into this. But I want to tell you the, the word of the Lord, and then this will help us for our next session, okay? So I want you to notice that when Haman and his elite group of conspir conspirators came together, they were using the lots. They cast lots. This was a way of divining the demons would be a part of those dice. The spirit world would be a converging there. This was consorting with witchcraft and sorcery. It was not chance. By casting lots, this was a way that the demonic voices could speak to a, to a group of people. It's very similar to Ouija boards where your hand just moves and everybody's in the room watching the hands move by themselves and uh, the demons are moving your hand across letters and you write the letters down. It, it, was, it was a similar way uh, that, that you're casting lots. What, what day is it? The 13th day of the 12th month. They have to wait till the end of the year. 12 months, 13 days. Now watch this. In order for that to come to pass, there had to be laws to be passed. There had to be all kinds of media outlets. There had to be infrastructure built uh, in anticipation of that day because they were going to pillage. They were going to destroy all Jews. So you're talking about mass graves. You're talking about uh, ways of transfer. You have to have all kinds of people transferring. They're thinking in their minds, transferring property, um, taking deeds out of this Jew's name and putting it in some Persian man's name. They're talking about lands being taken over, uh, maybe whole staffs being killed, servants being killed. So a, a network of people that are going to um, immediately step in and work and how are they going to have the people in place because they might already be working someone else's land after all these perceived you know, thousands and thousands of people being killed. So they're thinking about all this infrastructure. It's, it's Auschwitz. It's, it's, it's thinking about Holocaust. How do we kill all the Jews? Well, we, we have to build all the infrastructure to kill them. And so, so we have to find a faster way, he's saying. And then what do we do with the bodies? And what do we do with the hair? I mean, it's sick. But this is the reality of them building an infrastructure. Right now, hell is building the infrastructure for all of its plans. Every step of the way, folks, think about Social Security cards. You cannot buy or sell without a Social Security card. You can't get an ID without a Social Security card. That's a step towards the mark of the beast. So it's not just... The, the latest iteration of now we're seeing mandates around the world. It's not in every nation. It's not in every company. But we're seeing that, that spirit of that mandate. 
and uh, you know the Biden administration forcing all government employees and et cetera, and then the pushback and the riots in the streets. We're not hearing about it in the news, but I have a missionary in Paris that told me there was 150,000 people protesting mandates in Paris alone. So uh, we're seeing these things, uh, the pushback, but, but it, it is that control mechanism. It's one more step towards the total control. So we're pushing back against those agendas. We're pushing back, and the church should. But I want you to understand that these things are also a part of what is coming. How we think about it should not be as much as can we stop it as, God, what do you want us to pray? What are we supposed to do while the infrastructure is being built? So there was something else that happened. What was it? There was an acceleration of God's plan. And this is what the Lord said to me. I don't want you to spend all your energy trying to stop the infrastructure of hell that is being built, what he has determined to do. And the prophetic timeline, he said, the enemy, the enemy is already building all of these things and it still is going to take time for him to get it all done. He is still building all the infrastructure. But in the meantime, you have Haman and you have Mordecai. And Mordecai is constantly reminding Haman that he doesn't have what he wants yet. And that there are people that will not comply, that will not bow, that will not be intimidated. And so what happens? He decides that he is going to accelerate just this one part. I can't accelerate the whole. I can't accelerate it's still 13th day of the 12th month, but I can accelerate what happens with Mordecai. And what the Lord showed me is that acceleration was the result of prayer and fasting. Is that if Haman does not try to go faster, then Mordecai is not, is not brought to the surface. His former works are not brought up and... There is, not, uh, there is not time for someone to be in the authority to write additional laws and build more infrastructure. You see? So if, if Haman does not try to destroy Mordecai early, then there is no Mordecai able to undo the laws and deal with what's coming on the 13th day of the 12th month. But because he tried to speed it up, in dealing with in with dealing with Mordecai now, and now Haman actually gets dealt with instead, and now there's something that can be done. And so the Lord said to me, I'm working my own plan. So I don't want you to just try to slow down his. I want you to pray to speed up mine. Whew. Okay? I'm gonna say it again. We're not gonna spend as much energy right now trying to stop. In other words, they wept and interceded in the book of, of Esther. All around the world, they wept because the law was passed. 13th day of the 12th month. They got that pat, they got that through. It was sealed in every language. We cannot do anything about the fact that the law has been passed. That it's the 13th day of the 12th month. What can we do? We can fast and pray for the man behind it to be overturned. And so Esther goes in, she is received, she goes in before the throne, she is accepted, she has favor, he is exposed for what he is. He was going in though before the king to try to hang Mordecai now. And so what God says is I'm accelerating it. I'm accelerating. If it were not for the fasting and prayer and the initiative of Esther, it was the own plan of God. I will go in. I will go in. This is the plan of God that's totally separate from what's going on with, with Haman. It's because of Haman, but it's separate from Haman. It is, now the, it is now the prerogative of the king and the queen, and Haman can do nothing about it. So we must operate in the dimension of which hell can do nothing about, and we must accelerate the plan of God. And as we force the enemy's hand, what happens is it will be an overturning. So we are praying 
to accelerate God's plan and to speed up the actions of the enemy, to bring it to a head. That's how this will be overturned. And then what does is, what is, um, Mordecai do? He, he, he writes letters to reverse it. Now, to reverse it only meant that he could write more laws. And the additional law said that every Jew could stand and fight for himself. And that it was known from the king that Haman had written those laws. They were put in motion by him, but Haman had been judged. Therefore, you should not fear Haman, fear his people, but rather you should understand that the king is with the Jews and he is now telling them that they have a right to fight any of their enemies and kill them, that it is legal for them to wipe out their adversary. So now suddenly they are empowered and people suddenly want to be Jews instead of uh, wishing that um, the Jews demise. So this is how we will win this long game is by accelerating the purposes of God. So what I've always said is that fasting is accelerating. It's the opposite of slowing. So this is what we're going to pray to wrap this broadcast. And thank you for your patience today. Uh, we've gone a little over. Let's pray together right now. Shazi Lupavai Itomo la Jon Mita Munkenzen di Oye Nyesai to Jesu Yi Zaba Ukam Yedasa Kolam Yetose in Jesus' name. Accelerate your word, Lord. Accelerate your promise. Accelerate every prophetic utterance. Watch over it and bring it to pass. We pray that your plans and strategies, which are known, O oh God, from the foundation of the world to you alone. O oh God, as you reveal them to us, O oh God, in increments, let us see them, O oh God, in the advance of your kingdom in such a way that hell could never anticipate and could never stop. For even as Haman was, am was trying to ambush Mordecai, so instead he was destroyed by his own actions. So, Lord, let the enemy, O oh God, be destroyed by his own actions. In Jesus' name. We thank you for hearing us today. We thank you, Lord, for these promises that you've given to us in these prophetic words. We pray for all of the people that serve around the world. Oh God, in not just our religious circles, not just in official capacity in the body of Christ, in offices as bishops and deacons, as, as the fivefold ministry. Oh God, but those who serve in the civil governments, oh God, around the world, as judges around the world. We pray, God, for the advancing and the accelerating of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, overturn the tables, overturn, O oh God, the works of Haman and accelerate the work, O oh God, through your people, through your men and women of God. Let us go in and find favor in your throne room and let our Mordecai's, O oh God, be acknowledged in Jesus' name. We pray it now and we bless his name forever in Jesus' name. We love you. God bless you. Don't stay in the shadows, but walk in the light because with him, it's always high noon. Prayer Nation. We love you. God bless you. And the Lord willing, we will see you next Tuesday. This has been Prayer Nation.